Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is another midweek mini mail call. I think we're up to part 11, if you can believe it. On today's video, we're just gonna look at a couple things. There's some stuff for the Panasonic Toughbook and stuff for the Macintosh. Let's get right to it. Next package here is from Ed in Willard, Ohio. Well, we'll take a look at what this priority mail package contains. It's kind of heavy, so who knows what's in here. I might have a bunch of good stuff. Keep my hand over the address. Don't want to show any personal information on camera. Oh, we got some packing peanuts. Oh, okay, interesting, interesting. Let's just pull all this stuff out of here. Got some PC components, it looks like. Make sure there is nothing else floating around in here. I just have some of these environmentally friendly peanuts. I like these kind. You put water on these and I think they disintegrate. Okay, we got some boxes here. So MSI GeForce GT710. Don't think it's quite that inside the box. Something's floating around in here. But of course, you never know. I can tell right off of that what this is. That's it for that. What we have here is a high density Apple Macintosh floppy drive. It says Mac drive, and it is one of the high density types. I can tell by the part number on here, and hopefully this is in good shape. He sent me this after watching my video trying to repair that other drive that I got from a different mail call video that was damaged, and I think I made it worse And anyways. So yes, yeah, so we'll check that out. He also sent along a quantum hard drive. I gotta say, I never turn down SCSI hard drives. This is an Apple branded 160 megabyte SCSI drive, typical quantum ones. These are generally pretty reliable and having these small size SCSI drives is very useful for me. I have quite a lot of Macintoshes now and they all use these SCSI drives. I also have some Amigas that have SCSI interfaces. And while you can buy SCSI to SD adapters, little circuit boards that use a, an SD card as a SCSI hard drive, they cost like $65, $70. And for a computer, I don't use a whole lot. Sometimes it's just easier for me to install a hard drive like something like this into it, especially if it works. And that way I have a working computer. Okay, and then we have this larger five and a quarter inch device here. I almost cut myself with the knife there, but I didn't. Let's take a look. So this is a SideQuest drive. SideQuest was a removable hard drive format, kind of similar to iOmega zip drives, sort of. Those are more like large floppy drives, but this is literally like a removable hard drive platter. So it has a hard platter inside a cartridge and you stick it into this slot and this spins up and gives you 88 megabytes of storage. The original SideQuests were 44 megabytes and then they came out with this later version that was 88. Unfortunately, I don't have any SideQuest cartridges, either 44 or 88 megabytes to test this. But Ed sent this over to me because I'm interested in weird storage mediums. And I think that this is one that's not exactly weird, but it's just something that a lot of people these days don't know about. It was pretty popular back in the day. My father had a SideQuest 44 megabyte uh, disk system. So this should be compatible reading those, but we'll take a closer look at this stuff on the bench. I'm really curious what these packing peanuts look like when I put water on them. So let's just test that out. Uh, nothing actually. Oh, wait a second. Look at this. It turns completely to mush. Mm, it smells a little bit like a biscuit, like a cracker or, or bread or something. So obviously this is made out of some type of biodegradable product, which is great because that way if it ever ends up in a landfill, well actually these will, cause I put them in my trash can. As soon as they get rained on, they'll just turn to, to mush. All right, let's take a look at this stuff. So we have the hard drive, floppy drive, and the SideQuest drive. Let's first start with the hard drive. Well, for testing, I think I'm gonna use the dodgy Macintosh bench I have. This is the repaired power supply out of one of those Mac classics. This is the CRT I rejuvenated in that video where I rejuvenated it. And in this bag right here, we have a motherboard. 
This is the motherboard from the number three Mac Classic machine, the one that got the tantalums originally, needed a couple bodge wires to repair things. The reason why this is out of the computer is because that number three Mac Classic now has a Classic 2 motherboard in it, the one that I got in a previous mail call video. But in the meantime, I use this for all my bench testing purposes. So I just have to plug that in there. And let's power this thing on to see if it's working. Sounds good to me. Yep, it booted right up. This thing is configured in the PRAM to boot straight to the ROM disk, so even though the hard drive is not yet connected, we still have a working booting computer. So I have a SCSI cable here, so let's plug this into the motherboard, into the hard drive, and give the hard drive a little power. In case this is actually working, I'll just connect a mouse and power this on. That hard drive does not sound very healthy. Yeah, it's spinning up and down. And it spun down. It really sounded like to me that that thing had some kind of a head crash. I am going to hold this closer to my microphone so you guys can hear this more clearly. Listen to this. Yeah, that's not good. Well, I think it's time to open this thing up, take a look at what we see inside. Oh, you know what? That screw, that screw was barely on there. Let's take all of these out. Uh, I don't know how I didn't notice it, but there are six original holes for screws and I just took five screws out. So that means that this thing has been opened. Yes, indeed, there is shrapnel on the disc. Let me get a close up for you guys. You can just see on the camera those specs all around there. I'd say that this head, they seem to kind of line up where the head is. It must have got impacted or something something bad happened. And I, when I turn it, I can hear the heads kind of rubbing against those those little divots. So that is definitely one bad hard drive. So now I've touched the disc, so oh no. I notice right here on the top, this has been impacted by something. Although the top cover itself seems fine, but that clearly is not right there. Now the drive's not gonna go straight into e-waste. In fact, I'm gonna take this PCB off. There seems to be a couple components that are useful. There's like a RAM chip here, a few other things, uh, TTL logic chips that I can use for repairs on surface mount stuff. So I'm gonna keep the PCB and I did take this EEPROM out of this socket here to Turns out this chip is a microchip 27C512. Is that an EEPROM or an EEPROM? Not quite sure, but we'll save it nonetheless. Okay, everything's out. Oh, look at this. I guess there's some kind of foam under here that's pretty much self-destructed. Ooh, that's, that's horrible. Looks like right here, some kind of a board-to-board -board inter interconnect, one of those uh, zebra strips, I guess they're called. It connects those four pins through to something inside the drive, and this is a... Uh, a little piece of rubber, so obviously that seals. That's kind of cool. Kind of cool, it says MKE, made in Japan right here. Now I know people are gonna tell me that I should be saving these uh, magnets here. There's two neodymiums, but I actually have a ton of those because I've had a lot of hard drives that go bad and I've taken a bunch out and so I, I really don't need more. So this is gonna go to e-waste. Oh, I just figured out something cool. Those screws from the top of that quantum hard drive, the five that I took out, those are metric screws that are the same screw that's used in the Amiga 4000. If you've ever taken apart an Amiga 4000, you know that the screws it uses are standard metric screws, but they're just not the same as what's used in PCs. It's good I tried it because here in the US, you just don't find a lot of metric screws and they're not super easily available like they are in Europe. So anytime I find them, I put them aside and keep them in a little storage bin for future use. So let's take a look at this floppy drive. So I'm noticing that this top cover on the floppy drive is from some other Macintosh that I am not familiar with. It's definitely not from the classics. It's from something else. Oh, this thing is pretty clean. Although, check that out. It's missing the little metal cover that goes on the head. It's pretty clean. It looks not too bad. 
Let's see if this thing actually goes down properly. Uh, yeah, it doesn't seem gummed up actually. It looks okay. There's definitely the jack screw for the head stepper assembly. It needs a bit of cleaning, but, but that's totally normal. So I have an Apple Macintosh disk drive floppy drive cable. Let's plug this in. Okay, power up time. The head moved, good sign. I have two floppy disks to try, an 800K disk and a 1.4. So let's start with this 800K Adobe Type Manager disk. Appears to be reading it without issue. Oh, the eject is jammed though. So I tried to eject and it didn't work. So I'm gonna take this eject motor right off the drive. Oh my God, it's so, so stuck. Come on, there we go. And I'll try this high density disc once this boots up. Let's try reading Photoshop, installing Photoshop LE. Of course, there's nowhere to install it to because there's no hard drive. It'll try. System 604 or greater is required. Well, that is newer than what's on the ROMs on this thing. And now to format an 800K disc and see if it gets through the entire format without issue. Gonna format it two-sided. And initialization failed. So I know this disc is good because it was in my box of good discs. Uh, this stuff's all been formatted and checked. So this drive may not be working quite right. I'm gonna try formatting a high density disc here and see if this works. And it just failed as well. It would have ejected the disc if it could. I am just checking the read right heads. The bottom one is very clean, looks good. I am just gonna try using this cleaning floppy in here. See if that makes any difference. Put this high density back in. I know this is a good disc. Seems to be going further than it did the first time, so that cleaning disc actually might have helped. Look at that, it worked. Yep, there it is, untitled disc. Let's go back to this uh, double density disc, see if it formats this properly now. Amazing, that works as well. So it was just dirty heads, at least for the reading and the writing of the disks. Now I have a video on how I service these Apple disk drives and I'll put a link in the description to it. So I won't show you guys here. It involves taking the drive apart, cleaning the old lubricant off, re-lubricating it and putting it back together. It's pretty easy actually once you get the hang of it. So one of the biggest problems with these drives is the eject motor and gear assembly. So this is the motor right here, the circuit board, and under this metal cover here are the eject gears. And there's a whole gear reduction system. Well, there's a gear in here that's attached to the motor. That gear always fails. It's some, made of a different material than the rest of these, which I think are nylon, probably designed to fail in case this ever jams up. It won't strip all the gears. It will just break that one gear. Well, over time, it, it gets sort of decays and falls apart and becomes brittle, so it breaks really easily. Now, getting this cover off is a little bit of a trick. There's a little plastic clip right here that you need to move to the left here, and then this cover lifts off. Well. It's easy to break, and if you try to pull on it with your finger from the top here, you could put too much force on this, it snaps it right off, and I have done that accidentally. Well, a viewer told me that there is a little slot right here, and you have to stick something in it like these tweezers, and then you're able to lever that little clip out, and at the same time, I'm gonna try to do it and show you on the camera. So you lever it, and then you can lift the cover off with your finger, and. It's far easier and there's very little risk of breaking that clip. Well, there's your problem. So let's lift out this top gear here. And there is the issue right there. This gear has already self-destructed. There's a part of it there and the other half there. This little cog here is the motor and then it drives this gear. Well, this gear snapped already and there's no way to get this working unless you get a new gear. Now there are sellers on Ebay's that sell new gears. You can try printing them yourself as well, but you need a pretty high resolution printer. But I had a set of these that I ordered on Ebay and I've used them all up. But I luckily have a couple spare drives as it is. 
So right now I am not gonna repair this because I don't have a gear to repair it with anyways, but I will just mark this down as needing a new gear. And then usually if you just clean out all this old uh, gunky, there's a bunch of gunk in here, this should work again. Now this gear does seem a little stiff. This is the motor. Usually a little bit of lubricant on there and you just run the motor. Should actually fix it, but uh, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It just needs a new gear and a good cleaning. I will put this good gear back in here. That way I don't lose it, but I'm taking the broken piece out anyways. Just so I don't accidentally lose these two screws that hold the eject motor down, I am gonna just put them back into the drive just uh, for safekeeping. So other than needing a good cleaning on the disk drive and a cleaning and a new gear in here, this drive is working. So for testing the SideQuest drive, I can't really test it properly because I don't have any SideQuest cartridges. But at the minimum, I can plug it into this Mac motherboard with an external power supply because the power connector on the Mac analog board isn't really powerful enough to run something like a SideQuest. Although I don't have a disk to put in it, so it probably won't draw that much power. But anyways, I'm gonna plug the SCSI cable in, power this up, see if I can at least see it with a program like SCSI Probe, and I'm gonna boot off this zip drive here. I'll pop a System 6 disk in there. I have the SideQuest drive plugged into this external hard drive power supply here. I use it for powering up hard drives. I'm gonna plug them into USB, for instance, to copy files onto the PC or whatever. So it has a little inline power switch here. I'll turn it on. We have the green and the orange LED on the SideQuest drive and it made a click, which is correct for what it should do. And I'll power up this Mac. Just turning up the brightness on the CRT a little bit. It was low, not because this CRT, which is the rejuvenated one, it was low because I was doing some testing and I just turned the brightness down, but it looks great still. Okay, so there is the System 6 partition on the zip drive. This mouse is not working properly. I need the mouse pad for it. There we go. I'm just gonna switch the startup device to boot off the zip disk because the ROM disk, you know, doesn't have any drivers loaded. Oh, come on, what is this crash? Sorry, system error occurred. Coprocessor not installed? What is this even talking about? Okay, well, the system actually booted without these things in here, but I don't think I have SCSI probe on here now. I think that should be okay. Yeah, I don't have SCSI probe on here. I wonder what was crashing this exactly. I took out the iOmega driver, the Mac portable thing, a program called Mount Image, which allowed me to mount disk images as a virtual drive and after dark. So one of those four things, I guess, was crashing this computer. All right, I have this silver lining utility here. Silver lining is a SCSI disk tools. I've showed it on some of my previous videos. Hopefully it should show this SideQuest drive. All right, so it shows SCSI disk 85R. That's gotta be the SideQuest drive. Now there's no disk in there, so what am I gonna be able to do? Not really anything. The 100R is clearly the zip drive, and I don't have any other physical drives connected. Now there is another SCSI ID, it's SCSI ID 7 but that is actually the SCSI ID of the computer itself. It doesn't show up in this list, but basically with regular 8-bit SCSI, which is what this is, you can never set your external device to be SCSI ID 7 because it will always conflict with the computer itself. So I picked the 88 meg drive and I don't really expect it to do anything. It looks like it's frozen up here. Oh, there we go. It says SideQuest 85R. Excellent. In the drive menu, there's drive info. And here we go, SideQuest SQ5110, capacity, et cetera, et cetera. And it holds 88 megabytes. So that's as much testing as I'm able to do with this SideQuest drive, not until I get some cartridges. So if anyone has any ideas where I can pick up some 44 meg or 88 megabyte cartridges to try out on this thing, let me know. And just a quick note here, there's the model number SQ5110, which is what we saw in the computer and made in Singapore. On the back here, DC input, 12 volts and five volts, and it has a warranty void sealed, which is not broken. And on this side, there's a serial number sticker, perhaps 6110, and, and there's the seven X'd out, but I don't know how old this thing is and from what date it is from. And the bottom of the unit just has a plastic cover over the PCB, but it does have this little motor here, which is obviously the spindle motor that is under the cartridge. So when you slide it in, this is what spins the physical disc. So thank you very much, Ed, for sending in that hard drive and this floppy drive along with the SideQuest drive. Hopefully I can get my hands on some SideQuest cartridges to see if this thing works. Okay, so we have a package here that came on the 25th of May. So sorry that it took so long. It's from person unknown. There's no return address, at least on the outside. But what you see here is my PO box. 
It's mail call PMB 244 4110 Southeast Hawthorne Boulevard, Portland, Oregon 97214. The address is in the description and also on my channel about page. So if you want to send something in for a mail call, you can just send it to my PO box. Okay, let's open this up. All right, what we have here is a memory module, some type of a SIM. And I have a feeling based on the date that this is probably a memory module for the Panasonic Toughbook. Yes, it says 256 megabytes on here. And I think this is PC100 memory. I did get an email from someone, or maybe it was a comment saying that they were sending this. So let's take a closer look at this on the bench. So here's the fantastic Panasonic Toughbook that Phil sent me from the UK. I'm curious if the magnet trick on the back is still working on. Oh yeah, look at that. It's still glued on there or epoxied on there. I use JB Weld to hold that on. Let's test this out. Oh yes, I just, I love that. Great fix. So the computer's been unplugged for a little while. Let's just see if it turns on and it does not. So I guess the battery has a pretty high self discharge rate. It's curious because the runtime on battery is actually not terrible, but I'm surprised that it self discharges so quickly. I just plug the power supply in. Do I remember how to get to the BIOS setup? I do not. I really, I really, really need to label these things with a P touch label to let me know what key to push. Okay, I, I pushed something to go into the setup. So this thing must have really run its battery down. It lost the date and time. CMOS checked some bad, so obviously like lost the time. Previous boot incomplete, default configurations used. And what's this here? Save to disk partition not found. Save to disk features disabled. That must be something to do with the default BIOS settings. I think, you know, the hard drive originally was partitioned with a, a hibernation partition. And since I got rid of that, you know, this hard drive is completely fresh drive. Uh, it's complaining about that. So that's no big deal. That's probably a result of the BIOS getting reset because the battery needs to be replaced. Okay, so it's F2 to go to BIOS. I need to write that down on a label so I won't struggle next time I power this on. So as you see, there's 160 megabytes of memory installed, and that's because there's a 128 megabyte SIM. There's only a single SIM slot, and then there's also 32 megabytes on the motherboard. Here's the memory I just unboxed. So it turns out this came from a viewer, Zed. I just found his email by doing a little bit of a search. I apologize, Zed, that I don't think I wrote back to you thanking you for this but I am thanking you now on this video. But let's uh, let's install this. Oh, why did the computer just go blank? Oh, screensaver, okay. Uh, let's put this memory into this computer and really bump it up. So even though this machine is built in the mid to late 90s, servicing it is a dream. It really couldn't be any easier. All you have to do is flip it upside down, push these two levers to the side, and you lift up right here on this cover, which is a nice metal cover. And there is the RAM slot right there. That's all it takes. You have the battery, the RAM, and the hard drive. It may actually be a good idea for me to store this battery outside of this computer when I'm not using it, just because in case the machine itself is draining the battery, I don't need to put extra wear on this. So I'll charge this up to about 60%, and then I'll pull it out of the computer and let this sit on the side. And I'll check the self-discharge rate at that point, but I do need to charge this up first. So popping out the RAM is an absolute cinch. You just pop, push the clips to the side, the memory module pops out. So let's check the RAM that Zed sent, make sure that it lines up and it does. Typically when the RAM generation change, like say one is PC100, next one is DDR2, it may look similar, the overall size, but the connector is gonna be different. But this one is absolutely the same. And this is the Edge 256 megabyte RAM. And we just push this into the slot like so, push down. And that is the extent of the memory upgrade. So I just have to reinstall the bottom cover, just push it down, slide that over, slide that over, and I'm done. What I really love about this computer is you just don't have to worry about throwing it around. This thing is tough as nails. Okay, and we'll power it up. Now it is F2 to go to the setup. I remember that this time. Well, I'll be, it still says 160 megabytes of RAM. That was definitely the 256 megabyte SIM that I installed. This was the one I just removed from the computer and it says 128 megabytes. In Zed's email, he said he had a 512 megabyte SIM he was gonna send me as well, but he didn't think it would work in this computer. Well, actually it's even worse than that. 
that the 256 megabyte one doesn't work either. Well, so that was a total bust. I think I'm gonna take this memory out of this machine because I don't wanna waste a 256 megabyte SIM inside this machine that can't even use it. So I'd rather just keep it external in case I come across another piece of equipment that can use those higher density memory modules. And I will put this 128 back in here, which I guess is the maximum memory configuration for this computer. So thank you very much, Zed, for sending me this memory module for this tough book. And I'm really sorry that it didn't actually work in this machine. Well, that's gonna be it for this mini mail call video. If you wanna to donate to the channel, you can check my channel about page where I have my PO box there you can send to. There's also an email address you can contact me. Uh, just keep in mind that if you try to access that about page on your phone, for whatever reason, it does not show you the email address info. You have to do that from your computer. So if you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that thumbs down button. Hit that subscribe button if you want to subscribe to my channel. And of course, that bell icon will notify you when I post new videos. And of course, put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. And that's going to be it. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.